Wines, and I am the National Sales Manager for Hillerson Wines. Um, I will let James take over, but just a quick intro for me. So I basically work with the Forlong family. Um, uh, Hillerson is the Forlong family's winery, and they've been up and running. Let's see, we made our first route in 2014, and I've been with them for about three years, um, the last three years, and selling their wines and marketing their wines all throughout the U.S. I'm based in California. It's a really lovely, beautiful family where every single member is involved in the winemaking process. Um, and they've been kind enough from New Zealand to let me represent them here in the States and talk about them. So hopefully I can do them justice um, and sell their wines. And then I'll let James navigate what he wants to do or what he wants me to do. And um, we'll go from there. Yeah, so I mean, wh what we've been doing is really, we've just been going, we've been going over, um, you know, can, kind of the, the, the basics of, um, of Hillersden, you know, the, the history, you know, where they do it, what they do, why they do it that way. Um, and then, you know, I, I, you know, we'd love to talk about New Zealand a little bit um, and, um, you know, just make it kind of a, a fun uh, drink along education uh, <laughs> session. So um, I'll, I, I guess let's start with, um, you know, kind of how maybe um, the Forlong family got into uh, wine. Sure. So, you know, winemaking, as you guys know, is, is funny. You have generational winemaking and you've got these families of winemakers that have been, you know, here for years. And then you've got this other side of the large conglomerates that are just, you know, business and negotiants. And um, I think the Forlongs kind of fall somewhere in between. So Bruce Forlong, who was the father of the family, was an engineer by trade. The family lived in Auckland, which is, if anyone knows New Zealand, that is like the city that's the Sydney to um, Australia. That's really the, the city of New Zealand. Everything else, you're going to get lots of sheep, lots of water. <laughs> Auckland's the spot. So they were city people. And Bruce was an engineer, and he retired from engineering. He sold the company, and he decided that when he retired, he would move to the South Island in the middle of the country and buy a farm. And his family was like, wow, like, we're going to move to farm life. Like, you know, they owned homes in the city and they were city people. And so he went down there and bought a farm, this beautiful piece of land, a little over 300 acres um, the, in a town that used to be called Hillersden, was the town is what it was called back in the day, um, pre-World War I. And he bought this farm and he realized maybe I'll plant grapes. He grew up actually as a missionary in Papua New Guinea. So he grew up farming. He understood agriculture. He was an engineer by trade. That's what he went to school for. So basically he retired from the city to the country to plant grapes in his retirement with the lovely romantic idea of I am going to retire and own a vineyard. And as I say, there's generational winemaking that gets it. And then there's like, you know, the large corporations. And then there's the people in the middle that are like, maybe I should make wine. Um, and I think that's where Bruce fell. And so he started doing grapes and he was just gonna, you know, take the grapes, sell them, make some juice, buy it off. Um, to this date, he says, retiring and buying a vineyard is harder than any job he's ever had in his entire life, as I know Pierce and James know, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, he's, he works nonstop. He's been exhausted um, and yet still loves it. So that's sort of how the idea came about. He saw a business opportunity at first. He thought this is a beautiful place to retire. And Marlboro was booming for Saw Blanc. So he thought, I know how to farm. This is a great business opportunity. I will start planting grapes and I will sell them off in bulk. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit about that real quick as a side note, because for people that drink New Zealand Sauv Blanc, um, you know, you probably, we kind of work against our reputation of New Zealand having this reputation of being like good value wine. And a lot of people like know how to get good bulk wine um, from New Zealand. But, you know, he thought, well, here's a business opportunity. And he was going to, you know, grow the grapes, um, take it to the co-op winery there, have them make the juice and just sell it off in bulk. Um, and then Caleb, who was his son, um, his middle son, who was very young, he was still at NYU, over here in the state setting, came home and saw what his dad had done with the winery and tasted some juice and was like, um, so let me get this straight. You're doing all the sustainability as the engineer. We're growing all the grapes. My younger brother, Matthew, is working the vineyard. Mom is involved in the business. So this is a family winemaking business, but we're selling bulk wine, like we're selling bulk juice. And he was like, shouldn't this be a family winery? And his dad was like, well, I guess we could do a few bottles as a family winery. 
Um, so that's sort of how Hillersden began. They realized they had a really beautiful vineyard that they were making some really interesting um, flavor profiles. They realized the entire family was working on it <laughs> um, and realized whether they knew it or not, they were actually running a family winery. So decided to create a little sub-label called Hillersden. So um, to this date, actually, we probably do about 4% of our wine is for Hillerston, and about 96%, we still grow grapes, do bulk juice, and sell it off. So an interesting thing is if you're buying Marlboro Sauv Blanc at the grocery store, there's a pretty good chance we're in all of those somewhere. <laughs> um, a lot of our grapes are sold, a lot of contracts blended into other, a lot of major companies. Um, we also grow Pinot Gris that we sell off um, and make all that. So, you know, the, the great thing about the business opportunity that Bruce saw and at the time and still with New Zealand doing so much sort of negotiation and large corporation grape buying um, is that he was able to do that as a business and make some money and have some liquid so that we could fund the personal business, which um, is most people can't do that as winemakers. It's like, you know, it's very expensive <laughs> and it kind of gave us the fuel and the liquid, no pun intended, that we needed um, to keep Hillers in going for the last few years. So that's sort of the origin story of, of how we came about. Yeah, it's a pretty cool story. I mean, it's, it's quite a, a transition to go from engineer and then getting kind of duped into having a winery for retirement and um, <laughs> then really having, you know, in the end of second career out of it. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool transition and then to be able to do it with your kids is always awesome. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit maybe about, uh, why he chose, um, the, the middle or the Marlboro area of, um, the South Island and, you know, maybe we can go over a little bit of the geography, um, of the New Zealand wine in industry as a whole. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so New Zealand wine, especially South Blanc, and I know I've got some, great educated wine experts on this call. So correct me if I'm wrong in regards to certain histories. Um, but you know, New Zealand really started to come about with their wine in the 70s and the 80s is when they really started to get acclaim for having beautiful Sauv Blanc. And that's the grape that they've always been known to grow there. Um, it's their, obviously their number one export is Sauv Blanc. That's what almost every consumer, so every customer, if you're gonna say, hey, do you drink wine from New Zealand? They're always gonna say Sauv Blanc. Um, they do a lot of other beautiful varietals there, but as far as what they export to the US, Sauv Blanc is what people drink, Sauv Blanc is what sells, so everything else is sort of far and few between. Um, so at the time, Marlboro had been probably, I guess when Bruce bought this, you know, um, since the 80s, still booming with Marlboro Sauv Blanc, and it's grown, you know, quite a bit every year. Every year it still grows exponentially for what we're doing for exporting in Sauv Blanc. So again, Marlboro was why he did that choice as a, as a business um, point of view. So New Zealand is two islands, North Island and South Island. The majority of the wine comes from the South Island, so that's going to be the Marlboro area, which is sort of the top of the South Island. And then you've got the lower end of the South Island, which is Central Otago, which is probably best known secondly under Marlboro for doing really beautiful Pinot Noirs. Um, so at the time, again, um, it seemed like a great business opportunity. And where Marlboro is, we are a little bit off the grid in the upper Wauru Valley. Um, still technically Marlboro, there's quite a few valleys that are considered the Marlboro region. And um, it was pure wilderness, truly. It's between two mountain ranges. And the largest river in the South Island, which is the Wauru River, literally runs through our vineyard. We've actually had flooding and storms where it's eaten some of our vines and we've had to replant. Um, but the soil does beautiful things also for us. Um, so it really was wilderness. And we were actually the first family to plant in the upper Wauru Valley. Um, so we kind of planted our flag there. What's great about being a little bit off the grid in Marlboro is we have this higher elevation sort of up in the mountains. So we have like the largest diurnal shifts or for, you know, I sometimes I say things and I'm like, I don't even know if I understand what that means, but we have really hot days, really cold nights. So that difference of hot today really gives a really interesting flavor profile because you've got hot days that are ripening the grapes and you've got cold nights that are giving some beautiful acid. Um, so our flavors are a little bit different than like Marlboro proper, which is known for kind of being flat and hot, a little more dry. Um, so for the Marlboro, I mean, for the New Zealand wine growing region, you know, when I went there a few years, two years ago to work harvest, Marlboro does mainly Sauv Blanc and that's their thing. That's what they do. But you can get other beautiful whites there. They do beautiful Pinot Gris, 
beautiful Rieslings, Gewurz demeanors, Gruners. Um, that's, that's really beautiful whites that ripen well, that have some really nice acid do really well there. Their red on the South Island is Pinot Noir. Um, it's an island, so it's a maritime climate. So um, Pinot Noir grows best there, especially in the south of central Otago. Uh, and then if you go to the northern, uh, the northern island, um, it's a totally different deal. You've got a bunch of different islands all over, like Wahiki, they do Bordeaux varietals. It's crazy. I spent five days tasting Sauvignon and white wines through Marlboro, and I was like, I need a red to save my life. And <laughs> I was like, I can't do it anymore. Then I went up to Wahiki and was drinking like these huge, gorgeous cabs, and it was kind of crazy and Bordeaux blends, and I had no idea that even existed. Um, but again, like, like every country, they have their own wines, they have what, what they do there, what they drink, their own flavor profile and their own palates, but they ex export what sells. Um, so Sauv Blanc is the thing. Yeah, they, that's something they've done a really nice job of and you yeah. probably appreciate on some level is just the, the kind of all-in mentality they took towards Sauvignon Blanc and, and they really branded a whole country um, and export market around it, which is, it's, it's relatively unique, especially in the new world to have done that. So yeah. kind of an admirable quality. Um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that you, you know, you, you talk about the, the Bordeaux varieties up in the North. It's, it can be a real challenge up there, right? Because it's much more humid in Auckland. So they, they fight a lot of disease can, and um, other pests up there where you have a, a, a little bit more pristine growing area um, in the Southern Island and you have, I, I, I think you have a more mountainous terrain in the Southern Island. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think so. I would say so. Um, yeah, and in the Northern Islands, so you have the North Island, but then you have a variety of different islands all scattered above the North Island. So it is a little hotter, you know, it is the weather there actually works a little better for Bordeaux. Um, but again, like, you know, people, customers aren't really gonna want a cab from New Zealand. It's just, they're gonna want a cab from California. <laughs> You know, or they're going to want a Bordeaux blend from France. And we actually, as a winery, I would love to hear people that, you know, just love to go out and buy wine and how they shop for wine at some point on this call. Because we, as a winery, when we started, we were doing rosé. We were doing Pinot Gris. We were doing Riesling. Um, we were doing rosé. They were all awesome, but nobody bought them. <laughs> nobody bought them. People were like, Pinot Gris, Italy, Pinot Grigio. Like, I don't want that from New Zealand. And, they, you know, and they, and even Pinots, our Pinots are tough because, People still haven't caught on for Pinot. So, you know, consumers are funny and their behavior is funny. And it's, it's, it's been interesting for us because we're so passionate about wine and we're wine lovers to have to try as a business to think in a consumer mentality of how someone walks into a store and buys something. Um, so that's always really difficult. We make great wines, but like people just want sort of what they know. Um, and so we've actually scaled back our portfolio. And now we just make, as you guys know, a many different styles of soft block. <laughs> so yeah. if that's what the people want, we're going to give it to them times five. Yeah. I mean, why don't you talk about, I mean, I obviously have had um, most of your Sauvignon Blancs, but why don't you talk about a little bit about the other wines that you guys produce and, and how they differ. Um, you, you, Hillerson single-handedly changed my mind about sparkling Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, yeah. The ones I had had before were true garbage. Like, <laughs> at same, same here. Uh, yeah. Having had some of the same ones James had, uh, <laughs> long story short, Sauv Blanc bubbles uh, changed it for me. Well, and you guys haven't had our estate sparkling, right? Uh, no. So I love to hear you say that about the long story short um, sparkling, but our estate sparkling, which we were not able to do last year for a winemaking reason, which we can get into if we want to, but um, that it's been 91 points wine enthusiasts and that has been our showcase wine and you guys haven't even had it yet. And I love our long story short bubbles, but I have to say when you have the estate, which is done Charmant style, so um, similar to how a Prosecco is made, um, it is, it's amazing. Like <laughs> It's so fantastic and it's so good that it is the one wine that still Every day I open up my email and people are like, hey, I had your sparkling at a bar in Philly. Where can I get it? And like, we get those almost every day. And I'm like, I'm sorry, next year, um, you know, or it's, we've sold out of it every year. Like every time we think we're allocating our inventory properly, we sell out. So I really can't wait for you guys to try that. Um, but going back on wine, so we do, we're, we really realize like Sauv Blanc can actually be a versatile grape and people that love Sauv Blanc can love it in a bunch of different styles. 
So you guys are drinking this, which is our long story short Sauv Blanc. And we have the bubbly version. So the version of just has some light carbonation and it just, like Sauv Blanc is already so crisp and so refreshing. We want to do something that felt a little celebratory. So just adding a few bubbles to that becomes a brunch wine, becomes a really fun happy hour wine, a really fun like, you know, wedding cocktail hour wine. Um, so that is one variation of how we do Sauv Blanc. And then we have another sparkling Sauv Blanc that I just spoke about. So that's Charmant. So that goes through a little bit more of a rigorous process, fermented twice in a pressurized stainless steel tank, made very similar to Prosecco. Um, and then we have a Fumé Blanc, which is 100% oak barrel. So for me, when I'm out and I'm pouring for people, I love to line up the Sauv Blanc, the sparkling, and the Fumé and let people know like same vineyard, same winemaker, same grape, three totally different tastes. And that's always fun to watch people be like, oh my God, I had no idea that three wines could taste so different. That's the exact same grape from the exact same vineyard. Um, that's always a fun tasting thing that I like to do for everyone. But, you know, again, like it's a really versatile grape. I think it does some great things if you have a talented winemaker and um, it's fun to showcase what it can do. And when I said like consumers don't want to buy necessarily Pinot Gris or Rosé from New Zealand or a lot of these things, they do love Sauv Blanc from New Zealand. So then they see the sparkling Sauv Blanc from New Zealand and they're like, oh. And then they see Fumé Blanc from New Zealand and they're like, oh. <laughs> so we found a little bit more success in our sales in regards to kind of riding the Sauv Blanc wave with like a little bit of creativity um, than trying to push varietals that are available from all over the world that people know in better regions. Do you think that um, maybe as the brand grows, the um, outlook at other varietals from you guys might change? Um, for us personally, I would say probably not. I think there needs to be a much larger consumer shift like in the market. I think, you know, the reason why Sauv Blanc from Marlboro in New Zealand got put on the map is because, you know, we had a number of critics start writing us up as, you know, that were respected wine critics as having, you know, Sauv Blanc as good as Sancerre, you know, and the French Sauv Blanc. And so that's how it caught people's eye. So I really think until, you know, we start getting recognition for Pinot Noir or, you know, people are starting to say like, oh, you, there's some type of marketing push or change of mentality that New Zealand Pinot Noirs are as good as Burgundy or as good as California. Then they I think, are. what's that? They are, for people they who are. Had. They are, they um, are. Well, from your, from your lips, James. <laughs> but, um, but until people get that, like, then we'll do it. But when you're a small family winery, like the bottom line is, is what we realize is, you know, production takes a lot of money. Marketing takes a lot of money. Labels on every bottle takes a lot of money. So at the end of the day, like you, we can only make what sells, you know, right. that's it. Like we have to make what sells. And it was heartbreaking for me because I think our Pinot Gris is so beautiful. Um, but the grapes are there. We still sell them. Uh, we're working on a tasting room in the vineyard. So we'll probably do that a little locally and do some reserve. Um, but as far as like, you know, cranking out the cases and shipping them to the U.S., um, I think there'd have to be a big shift in consumer behavior for that to make sense just from a business point of view. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's something that maybe some people don't necessarily recognize is that it's a huge barrier on some level to have more New Zealand wine in the States because shipping from New Zealand is a, that's a long ways to send wine and to have it at a, at a reasonable price is it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, yeah. Like you said, it all costs a lot of money. Um, I want to just jump back real quick when she was talking about Fumé Blanc. That is Sauvignon Blanc, and I, I believe it, it's essentially as, was a marketing term used in California, and I, I believe it was Mondavi who kind yeah. of led the way that's, with it. I think that's what I remember as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if there's ever any confusion, there, they are the same grape, just um, worded differently. Well, and it's funny that you say that because I think it was Mondavi, and he did it sort of as a marketing tool to try to like get people to discover a new wine, which was really just Sauv Blanc, but it was oaked. Um, and fume means smoke. So it was supposed to have like a little bit of a more like flinty kind of like smoky um, sort of style than like a regular Sauv Blanc done in a stainless steel. And when we were doing ours, it is 100% oak barreled. So we had these internal conversations like, should we sit, call it fume Blanc or should we just say Sauvignon Blanc oak barreled? And what it really came down to is California being one of our largest markets when people hear something is oaked, especially a white wine, you guys probably know what I'm about to say. Like your mind instantly goes to Chardonnay 
and you instantly think you're going to get something buttery or like super oaky, which is not the taste of our Sauve Blanc at all. So we actually thought putting like 100% oak barrel on a Sauve Blanc would turn people off for all those people that don't like Chardonnay. And for the people that like Sauve Blanc that were like, oh, I, like I don't want a Sauve Blanc that tastes like Chardonnay. Um, so we made like the marketing decision to call it Fume. Yeah, I think that was a really, I think that was a really sharp move. I think that absolutely helps the consumer. I know it's helped me a little bit um, when I'm taking it to, to people to sell it. It's, um, it, it's approached differently, which is, I think, really, and even for people who know wine, it's approached differently. Yeah, it is. And, and I, think it's a, I think it's a really lovely wine. I think it has some beautiful structure. I think it's really interesting. It got, we just got a 91 points back on that wine from Wine Enthusiast. Uh, I love to pour that wine for psalms and wine directors that are buyers because it's something new for them. Um, you know, from a sales point of view, like when I'm out there selling and I'm talking to someone at, at a bar and they're like, I've already got a New Zealand Sauv Blanc. I'm like, but do you have a Fume, you know, <laughs> or do right. you have sparkling? So that was like the business reason um, also behind our, some of our decisions is like, we wanted to take the no out of, out of people saying something to us. Like, you know, we had our estate line and people were like, no, you know, this is too expensive. I don't want to pay $12 for Sauv Blanc. I like to pay $8. And that's what we heard. Your, your Sauv Blanc is beautiful, but I need it at a lower price. And I heard that from the first year that I went out. So we went back and we made, long story short, and we released that brand last year under our Hillerson because now it takes the no out of it. It's like, oh, now we have an $8 or $9 Sauv Blanc. And when they say, oh, I already have a Sauv Blanc, we can say, do you have a Fume? Do you have a Sparkling? So, um, you know, it's interesting for us because, you know, I know that you guys are winemakers and we are a small family winemaker and you do it, you know, or a lot of people do it with romantic notions and I want to make wine and it's fun and I'm passionate. And then when it comes time to market it and to sell it and to put it on the shelf, you have to switch to this whole other business person side that you didn't know you had in your brain. It's like, well, it's great wine. And we kept telling everyone, our wine is so great. And this is our family story. And a marketing team finally worked with us and said, well, everyone thinks their wine is so great. And everyone thinks they have a great story. So who cares? It's all white noise at this point. You know? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. truth. Yeah, they said, stop making you the hero because people don't want to hear that and figure out how people are buying and, and market that way. So it's just, it's, it's interesting, as you guys know, as winemakers to, you know, try to figure out that whole other side um, of the business aspect. And we revamped our entire portfolio. We've invited, you know, changed our SKUs and our varietals from literally what we grow and what we plant. Um, we've changed our pricing. We've changed our labels. We've done everything thinking like, okay, I'm not the winery, but I'm the girl walking into the grocery store. This is what I do. What yeah. do I do now? And we, we built everything on, on that girl instead of the person saying like, oh, our wine is fantastic. It's lovely. Hear our story, you know? It's really hard. If you're, not, if you're not selling it directly to the consumer, there's a lot of stuff on the shelf and it's really hard to For sure. stand out. And I mean, the way you guys label, um, the long story short, I think, I think helps. It's, it's something that's very visible. And yeah. um, I mean, it's a, it's a, you guys are in a really, it's not that all wine is competitive, but New Zealand Sauv Blanc has become really competitive. And I, I think, I mean, you're talking about a small family winery, but you're, you're playing in a, a totally different league. This is a lot of these wineries um, that you're, you know, are com commonplace, like uh, Kim C Crawford, uh, Cloudy Nobolo, Bay. Uh, Nobolo, yeah. Right. These, these are owned by, these aren't owned by small family wineries. These yeah. are owned by big, big conglomerate players like Constellation Brands and, and um, you know, ones that own billion dollar spirits. Yeah. Um, so nine out of 10 wineries really that you drink from New Zealand don't have a winery, don't have a vineyard. Nine out right. of 10 that you drink New Zealand. So if you go to the grocery store and pick up a New Zealand Sauv Blanc and you try to go to their website and figure out where their vineyard is, you are not gonna find it. They do not have a vineyard. They're buying grapes from us and they're buying grapes from 20 other family vineyards and they're blending them together or, you know, they're sourcing all their grapes or, you know, so there's no story there and, and that's fine. There doesn't have to be a story, but then we talk about volume and then we talk about quality control. And I mean, a great story to tell is when I was there for harvest, New Zealand is very different than California and very different from other regions that most vineyards do not, they don't have their own wineries in New Zealand. This isn't commonplace like California. So there's literally like, three wineries in all of this, all of the Marlboro area and they're co-op wineries. So if you're a family winery 
you take your grapes and after you pull harvest, you take it to the co-op, you have a slot booked, you've got the workers there, they're doing your grapes, they're pressing, they're, they're doing your tanks and your winemaker shows up, but you've got to schedule your tanks, you've got to schedule your prep, you've got to schedule everything that you're doing. A lot of it's out of your control, timing wise, scheduling line, you're sharing facilities with all your competitors in the area. Um, so there is a lack of quality there and a lack of control there. And when I was there, I was walking through a bin and they had grapes and I looked in and looked at these grapes and they were like, Petrius, there was like fungus. They looked awful. I mean, we drop a lot of our fruit, like, and for those of you that may not know what that means, like we walk through and we drop anything that has a fungus that's disease that doesn't look good. Like we drop a lot of our fruit so that the grapes that actually go in the wine are, are really good quality. And a lot of those bulk brands, they just, they throw everything in because it's about how much juice they can actually get. Um, but I looked at this tank and I mean, I looked at the bin and it was just like, grapes were fungus. It was disgusting. And I was like, excuse me, can you, you please tell me what winery that is? Like, cause I was like, I need to know who I'm not drinking right now. <laughs> um, but you know, most people don't, don't ever see that. And so I, I don't know if I told you guys this when I was there um, last year, but we just completed our own winery on our vineyard. And it was a, a big, you know, investment from the bank. And so now we have our own winery. We have all of our own control to be able to do everything. We're, we're the only family owned winery that's on their own property in Marlboro. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big achievement, as you said, like we're a small family winery, but the fact that Bruce is an engineer, I think has really moved us to do a lot of things with the winery and sustainability that um, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do. We're trying to play in a little bit of a different league and pretend we're not family owned. <laughs> um, and it's working so far, so. Yeah, no, I, that's, I mean, that's a really, that's a really good way of looking at it with the engineering. I mean, he, I, correct me if I'm wrong, he's done all solar and I mean, he's really, I mean, he's really kind yeah. of made it so the winery operates on its own, doesn't really need any outside, you know, influence. Yeah, we've got yeah. two reservoirs on the vineyard and the house that is actually on the vineyard where they live is totally off the grid in regards to electricity. So everything is done with solar power. Um, he's created frost fans. We call him the mad scientist. It's really cold there at night. He has, he's created an app and he has these frost fans that if it drops below a certain degree at night, it turns his app on and alerts him. And then he goes outside and turns these frost fan heaters on and they're up in the sky and he's kind of created this thing. Um, if anyone is into wines, you know, that are sustainable or that really does matter to you, one of the coolest things that he did actually was, you guys know, you see the vines on the posts, you see the long rows, and at the end of every row, there's like, you know, there's these wooden posts. Well, after time, like those break and those decompose and they rot and you have to get rid of them and replace them, but they're chemically treated for a lot of reasons, so you can't burn them. So in New Zealand, these were just piling up in different places and in dumps because like you can't burn them, you can't use them anymore and people are replacing them. So Bruce created and cut metal and steel to create basically a, a steel sleeve. So when the post breaks, they actually take the post out and put it in the steel sleeve and put it in the ground. And we went from like 1700 broken posts to just having to throw three away because we replaced them all with steel sleeves. And then they weren't piling up and creating this sort of, you know, environmental disaster. And so New Zealand Winemaker Magazine like wrote him up and did this big feature on him in regards to this advancement that he had made for sustainability in the vineyards. So that's one of the most interesting stories that I like to tell um, about him as he sees a problem and he tries to figure out how to solve it. And it's, it's done a lot of great things for us. He's got a third career. After his <laughs> I know. We're like, just sit and drink the wine. It's supposed to be relaxing. You know what I mean? It doesn't sound like he can do that. No, it definitely can't. So what did they have you do it uh, when you went down for harvest? I picked Pinot. Picked Pinot? Yeah. Nice. And I do, we just got it in. We just got that in. Um, um, oh, someone is asking what he did before retirement. I think I mentioned that. So he was he went to um, college for engineering. So he was an engineer by trade. And then him and his brother opened their own engineer factory. It was like a steel cutting factory where they created like molds and cut steel and did different things. And, um, and he sold that company when he retired. And that's how he was able to buy the vineyard. Um, but yeah, I went down there. We were down there for 10 days. It was really lovely. They told us to bring our husbands. Um, so we had a really great time. The four longs welcomed us in their home on the vineyard. And um, we got up bright and early and we, did, we went down there for harvest. So we did harvest and we got to see all these trucks. Of, you know, They have workers come in from a lot of the islands. Um, and these guys are like, 
I mean, this is what they do. They, you know, they, everyone comes over by boats, they go down, they know what they're doing. They do this every season in New Zealand for harvest. My husband and I take two hours and we're halfway down a, a row and we're picking pinots so delicately. And these guys are like chop, chop, chop and throwing things on their head and throwing them in. And I'm like, it, it takes a lot. It's not easy. I'm like, how am I only down one row? It's two hours. You know, you have to decide what you're cutting and what you're picking and what you're dropping. And um, so we were harvest there. And then we kind of tasted our way through Marlborough and just really explored the wine scene there. We did um, a cruise that's like mussels in South Blanc where we went mussel diving and pulled out fresh mussels on the boat, steamed them and had South Blanc, went through tons of tasting rooms of our competitors, tons of tasting rooms of our friends um, that are also competitors, but friends. Um, and then my husband and I ventured up to Auckland and then we went wine tasting on the other islands in Wahiki. So um, it's, you know, people want to go to France and wine taste and people want to go to Italy and drink wine. But I mean, New Zealand is gorgeous. And if you like white wine and South Blanc and zip lining, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, that sounds like a, uh, I'll sign up for that right now. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's off, right? Like it's off season for us. So we could, you, we could maybe swing that even. Yeah, I know. That's that's what's awesome about it. So we're harvest, you know, um, April, May. So yeah, I um, that's kind of where I was in that that southern hemisphere. I was in uh, Margaret River over in Western Australia. Oh, yeah. That's kind of where I decided wine was going to be uh, my career, but um, or at least I was going to experiment with it being a career. Um, so going back with um, Sauv Blanc, you were kind of talking about the the labor that goes into it there a little bit with dropping fruit and and all that Sauvignon Blanc is an incredibly vigorous grape it wants to it wants to produce really heavy crop loads it wants to um, have huge sprawling canopies and um, in, in some ways I think that's probably why it was picked I, I don't think anybody fess up to that now um, but it was it was able to produce a lot of wine in um, in the um, kind of flatter areas of Marlboro where she was talking about it, it can produce a, a huge amount of wine. And so when she was talking about some of it getting botrytis or, or things like that, it's, it's a volume thing where if one bin has a little bit of rot in it, a lot of these bigger brands don't necessarily care because if they have uh, another thousand. They it. They're going to blend it into many more grapes and people aren't really going to taste it. But for a smaller winery, it'll definitely affect the quality, right? Absolutely, right. I mean, even... I mean, even a few bunches in a, in a small batch will affect the taste a lot. So, um, yeah, for a small winery, that, that makes you cringe and feel a little bit ill. But, uh, but you know, about the business side of that, you know, people always say, like, what makes the difference between a $15 bottle of wine and a $25 bottle of wine and a $35 bottle of wine? And there's so many, as you guys know, there's so many things that come into play. But as we talk about this, that's one of them. So the more fruit and grapes that you put in the bin, the more juice that you get, the more you can bottle and the more that you can sell. So sometimes right. you have these family wineries and you think like, oh, I'm paying $50 of, you know, $50 for this bottle because it's a family winery, which means they're fancy and it means they're good. Like in some regards, it doesn't always even mean that they're good. It means that, you know, they spent the same amount of money to grow a lot of fruit, but then had to drop, you know, maybe a lot of grapes or their volume has to be smaller. They had less juice or... There's a number of reasons why it was more expensive. Sometimes it is because they're better. Sometimes it's it's not. Sometimes it's because they had mistakes that year or it makes it more difficult. Um, so yeah, those sort of things and the volume and you know how much you know juice you actually produce also affects the price. Yeah, I mean from a from a perspective of um, you know you'll see some bulk brands go up into the ten tons per acre. Um, you know, for a small winery, some of like the really famous regions or, or even some of our vineyards, you'll be doing more like two and a half tons. Yeah. So just on grape cost, grape cost alone, um, that can uh, affect it there. And then, you know, from a, a labor standpoint, you know, it's just, it's how many people have, how many people versus a machine probably touch your wine is a huge part of the cost as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and and did it go? Was it in a big stainless steel bag? You're oaking it with a red. Was it a, a, a an old barrel that got cut up and just tossed back in, um, or you know, was it new? And how long did they have to hold it? And you know, all those different things. There's a lot of things that go into to making that. And I think that's one of the things that I think is really cool about the long story short is it's a really well made wine, 
Um, and the price that you guys are able to get it out here for is really awesome. <laughs> well, since, you know, since you mentioned that we talk about business and you're talking about New Zealand and we obviously have to import our wines, the majority of New Zealand, you know, wine that comes, you have an importer, right? So you're working with a number of different people. You're working with an importer that actually puts your wine on the boat, brings your wine over to the country and gives it to you. And then you have your distributors that sell it throughout the States. So one of the very smart things I think that we did a few years ago, and I, you guys may know this, but um, we import ourselves. So we actually went and got our own import license. It's, you know, a lot of time, it's a money, it's a lot of hoops to jump through, but it has served us really well because we have control when our wine goes on the boat, when it gets over here. We definitely pay for it, you know, to do that, but it saves us so much money, which is why we're actually able to sort of cut that middleman out um, and actually sell it at the price that we do because we're selling estate wines, um, you know, at prices that, you know, big bulk wines are selling. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why we're able to do that because we don't have to take that cut from the middleman. We can actually save that money. And it really did us well because when I talk to partners in different states and I say, oh, you know, hey, we're looking to come into Illinois and we're looking for a partner to distribute us. Like, are you interested? And they're like, oh, who was your importer? Because I've had so many issues with importers and I can never get my wine and I can't get my New Zealand wine or it's a disaster. And I'm like, oh, we import ourselves. Like, if you call me and tell me you need it, you'll have it here in three and a half weeks. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's opened a lot of doors for us. People, states have come on with us specifically because they know we warehouse ourselves, we import ourselves. I literally will do the scheduling. Like I know how long it takes to get on the boat, how long it takes to get here and how long it takes to clear customs. Um, it makes things much more efficient and, um, and cheaper. It I makes guess. my life a lot easier. As a <laughs> oh, Not, do you feel I, it versus your brands that you import through like importing companies? Well, yeah. So I mean, for, for the wine trust, right. When I'm working yeah. for them, I mean, we have a lot of times, you know, there's, there's some great wine, but I don't always know if I'm going to have it. And so yeah. going to a customer or getting a reorder um, can be really challenging. But with you guys, I know the wine's probably in the States. And so I can, you know, with relative confidence, say, yeah, yeah I can have that in a week or two. It's, yeah. it's here. I just, it may have to come north, but it's way easier from our perspective, you know, for that too. And I, I don't know, long, long story short, it's probably, it's one of the top two that I probably sell. It, it, oh, I'd love really, to hear that. That's great. I really like it. Um, I mean, for a lot of I mean, I mean, Amy knows that was like one of my top selling wines, like easy. I mean, a lot of those <laughs> ones I sell are stores that you guys probably got since I took over a bunch of your stores. Yep. Um, yeah, I, exactly. So I want to go back to a question at the very beginning. Um, I think Jean was kind of asking and saying it that volcanic islands or the South Island is fairly volcanic. Um, and does, does that kind of play a role in the soils? I, I don't think it necessarily does for from Marlborough, but maybe Otago? Um, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about the soil difference in Otago than in Marlborough. It doesn't really, in Marlborough, we have a mix of, you know, different types of topsoil, like silt, clay, loom. Um, we have huge, like, head-sized stones, like, you know, from our vineyard that we actually, on our Sauv Blanc, um, and our estate sparkling really help radiate that sun and that heat and ripen those grapes really, really well. Um, but it, no, I mean, that's not really what we have in, in Marlboro, as far as I know. Um, I think, I'm not sure about Otago. Yeah, I think a lot of, in, in Marlboro, you, you, like you said, you, there's a bunch of different rivers that come, come through, and I think that that's carried kind of like, kind of like here in Washington, it, it's carried a lot of um, what the topsoil and, and soil compositions become, kind of that silty loam. Right. Um, pretty similar, but I, I I don't want to be I'm totally quoted on this. I, I do think that the that the Otago area is more prone to some of those volcanic soils. Um, and, and it may be because when you get towards the coast and you go down the coast, you definitely have that kind of terrain much more. So, um, but I just, um, yeah, I, I don't know enough about Otago in regards to, you know, how they grow necessarily. I don't either for the <laughs> amount of reading I've done. I should know a lot more about it. It, oh, I, I know a lot more about it, but I just, you know, usually I just talk, you know, Marlboro <laughs> wines and soft blog. So, I mean, Otago does beautiful Pinot Noirs and they do some great wines down there for sure. Yeah, it's, um, there really are. I had a friend bring me uh, a Gamay back from one of their trips down there. And oh. it was probably better than most of the Gamay that I've had at any point in time um, from 
from Beaujolais, or sorry, I put my hand in the, the picture there trying to read some of these. Um, uh, price points. I'll uh, throw those out in an email to you guys, what our price points are. Um, right now, they're a little bit different than they will be potentially in a week. <laughs> They so, want whichever price is best, the price now or the one in a week is what they yeah. want. You, you, you want the price now, um, but um, I'll put those out to you guys. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess if there's more questions, let's let's take those. Um, if there's any, anything that anybody else wants to know about New Zealand or, um, or Pillarsden as a whole, um, I think we ended up covering kind of a, a lot there, maybe in a different... Uh, in a different route than I intended to. Sorry. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, long story short is um, someone's favorite friend saw Blanc in Australia, so mm -hmm. that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, got, we were just saying, like, okay, next time a global pandemic hits, can we like go quarantine at the vineyard in New Zealand? Um, that's which right now is the only country that's back open without like any cases and doing well. Um, so we should be there, but we're not. It's unfortunate. It's because they were all sheep, right? <laughs> that's because like everybody in New Zealand is social distance. Like the nearest right. house is like a town away. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. Um, I, it's a country I would really like to go to. I, uh, my friends went there after we were in Australia and I didn't go. I actually stayed, I mean, it was a good choice because I stayed in Western Australia to work with wine, um, but I wish I had gone. It's, uh, it looks and I will awesome. say, since we're talking sheep, in case people don't know, is that we actually are also a working sheep farm because if not, like they would take our license away for not being New Zealand, not being Kiwis professionally, but um, we have 500 sheep on the farm. So Matthew, who's our vineyard manager, also manages our sheep. So it's like the real deal. And we actually do use the sheep to help prune our vineyard. And that's like a true story. Like we let the sheep go through and eat the leaves off to help, you know, actually get some sunlight in there. And we do it at a time where like they won't touch the grapes because they don't taste good. You know, they're like not ready. They're not interested. Um, so we just let them roam and they help us prune. That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to show that's people a picture on Saturday for the next one we have. Um, I don't know. I don't think Wendy was here when you were when we did our our portfolio tasting last time. But they produce a UK sparkler, and they have she go through yeah. there. And we were over yeah. there. We took pictures yeah. in there. It's real cool. Uh, this is yeah, this is by far our heaviest sheep week. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are both our sheep sheep vineyards for sure. Um, a question. We almost put that on the label, Pierce. Just sheep vineyard. Uh, you know, you should have. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I like this one okay too. Not bad. Yeah. Um, a question came through there kind of about uh, the business side of um, where you guys kind of were a year ago, but maybe talk about kind of what the scale was from, a, I guess, maybe an exporting standpoint from when you guys started to now and um, I guess where you hope to go. Um, where I hope to go is wherever COVID-19 takes us. Um, it's a scary, scary time. But um, yeah, we have pretty much... Um, been tripling our case production every year for the last three years, which is fantastic. So just a little explanation on our growth. Um, so I mentioned like the first wine we did was 2014 and we did a Pinot Gris and a Sauve Blanc and that was it. And those did really well. Um, obviously, um, we now have our 2019 that has just come in. So really, we're just like four, five varietals in. So four or five years, still very young for, and I feel like we've accomplished a lot for what we've done. But in the same sense, as much as we've accomplished, we've pivoted so many times. Um, and I think the tough thing for like a small winery is every time you pivot or you make a mistake business-wise or you have to change, it's all dollars, right? From a business point of view, costs money, you guys know, right? So it's like, great, we're going to make, everyone's into rosé and we see the market and we see rosé trending and we're going to make rosé and why is anyone buying our rosé and it's absolutely delicious. And, you know, I mean, we've pivoted with our label designs, which costs money every time you hire someone new to design it, every time you have to run off new labels, every time you have inventory out there that already has the old labels on it and you have to wait for your distributors to sell it through before you bring in the new labels or you've just wasted it. 
Um, so we pivoted with labels, we pivoted um, with our varietals. We had seven different varietals at one time. Now we're down to you know four or five different Sauv Blancs. Um, so we've had a lot of growth. We've had so much change too. And if we hadn't had that change, we'd probably have more growth. But I think you just have to, in this market, like see what's working and, and quick change, you know, before things start to get, go too far down the wrong road. But we kind of started at about 2,500 cases importing from New Zealand. Um, and this year uh, we were on track to do 15,000. Um, from New Zealand. And we cut that back to 10 because really when we were shipping everything over, it's supposed to be the end of May. So when COVID hit in March, um, we ask all of our states and all of our partners, like, can you tell us how many cases you think you need? And we, we take that number and we mm -hmm. do that into our inventory. And so we're like 15,000 and then we're like, we're not. Um, so we really, we trim that back. Um, but yeah, we are growing exponentially. For instance, when I came on three years ago, we were in seven states. And we are now in 29 states. Um, so in the last year and a half, I took myself out of the field here in Los Angeles and spent the last year and a half just literally picking up the phone and cold calling states from you know Florida, Louisiana, to Michigan, to Illinois, to Maryland, to Delaware, and getting different partners on board, getting them on board with the brand, launching it, kicking it off. So to go from seven states to 29 states, to go from 2,500 cases to 15,000 cases in four years. I mean, we're doing really well and that included a lot of change and a lot of money spent on those changes in the meantime. Um, and literally, I mean, it's like, it's not funny, but literally we're like, oh my God, this year at the beginning of the year, we're like, we finally did it. We have all of our ducks in a row. Like these varietals are working. These labels are doing really well. We've like tripled our partners this is going to be our year. Like we knew this was going to be the year that we were going to start really seeing, you know, the change, but it's 2020. So that didn't happen because you don't know, you don't know everybody's that. ass. <laughs> you don't know that you have seven months left, six months left. Uh, That's true. That's you can true. still do it. Let's, uh, let's not, let's not slam the door. I mean, the great yet. thing, no. And I will say the great thing is that, you know, as guys in the industry know, like wine retail has skyrocketed, right? And if, and it's funny because like, if we were in a position where we had already been on wine.com or we had already been on some of these retails, it, we would be insane. I mean, our partners have lost, a lot of our partners have lost a very large percentage of their business because restaurants are closed, but they're almost making up for it in what they're doing for retail. And so I had just acquired a um, 110 store chain right before this happened in California called Save Mart and Lucky. And they brought us in and they tested us in a certain amount of stores and we did really well. And they ordered a pallet, 56 cases. And then three weeks later, they ordered another pallet, 56 cases. And um, you know, we, that was included in like what we were gonna do. We're like, oh, we're doing great, 110 stores. They're gonna roll us out in every store. And then as soon as COVID hit and they shut down, they said, well, we're just, we, we're not rolling out samples. We're just keeping what's already on the shelf. So if we had have made that window and been in there right before, we wouldn't be seeing issues. You know, if we had have been on wine.com or a lot of the online retailer sites, um, you know, I think like, and we are doing okay, but you know, we just, you, the retail would be making up for what you're losing for restaurants. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? Because there, there has been a little bit of mentality that, that sales are way up and there is a little truth to that. I know there was a wine enthusiast article recently. Is that, was that the publication Pierce? Uh, it was either, it was either spectator or enthusiast. I think it was yeah. enthusiast. Actually, I mean, you had the article firsthand, so I, I, I don't remember if you remember the details of it, but it, it kind of alluded to the fact that it's, it's a little bit of a, the industry as a whole is still taking a pretty good shot right now. Yeah. Um, and that yes, people are drinking more, but it's, it, it's not compensating totally for what's been lost from a restaurant standpoint. I know, you know, I know. Well, not just restaurants, but venues and theaters and entertainments and beer. So mm -hmm. that's, I yeah. think where we're seeing a lot of that, you know, those issues happen. Yeah. I think, I think beer was actually taking a bigger hit than wine was um, because like you said, the, Sporting events. the venues being closed. Yeah. It was, it was really taking it hard there. Um, but you know, I mean, there, there's also some good things that happen when, when events like this happen where there's, there's some new creative thinking that can come along and maybe we can figure out better ways to sell wine. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of, that's kind of my hope is that, um, you know, people, people kind of look at maybe how they buy wine a little bit differently. And to your point, like, 
you know, I think a lot of, you know, I know wineries, the majority, like, I think the number is something like for wineries, like here in California, like 80% of the business they do is direct to consumer with people walking in their doors through their tasting room, you know, like a lot of these wineries in California are not on grocery store shelves, or they're only on random, you know, lists here that in there, most of the majority of the business they do is people walking in buying from the tasting room or signing up for wine clubs. So I think, you know, when we've had shelter in place for these last two months, that's where a lot of people relied on getting their wine was from the wine clubs that they already belong to, the tasting rooms they already belong to, getting on there, ordering that. So I guess the lesson of this is like build your online, um, <laughs> build your online customer base for the next global pandemic. So you'll be yeah. okay. <laughs> I mean, that's that's actually why Pierce and I started this is we were talking with some of our friends who um, one they one they had just moved into a brand new um, tasting room and it was Washington Wine Month and they were closed and. Um, they were taking it pretty good. And so, you know, we were just, we were like, well, we'll try and sell what we can and we'll do it this yes. way. And so we started doing these just kind of for that reason there. Most people don't necessarily understand that every winery is not one, they don't want to be in a retail chain and, yeah. and that they aren't. And so in a time like this, there's, you know, they have their wine club most likely, but that may or may not cover the, the bills. And sure. so not being able to have that traffic is, is really hard for a lot of wineries. And just a quick note about saying like most want a lot of wineries that people don't realize is a lot of wineries don't want to be like on a grocery store or on a shelf. Like the reason that, I mean, one of the reasons that I found, which was interesting for me is like when we got into grocery stores, I was ecstatic. I was like, oh my God, we got into Gelson's. There's 28 stores here in Southern California. Or we got in here or we got in, you know, all these things. And then you don't realize when you're a small winery, like they don't sell the wine for you. Like it dies on the shelf. It collects dust. They don't sell the wine for you. So it's not about getting it on the shelf. And I thought, oh, great. Well, now we're in Gelson's. They have 28 grocery stores here in Southern California. Like, we're, we were in. We made it. Like, no. Like, we have one New Zealand wine, and there's 15 other New Zealand wines on the shelf next to it. And the guys with the big money come in and put tags on it that it's, like, on ad, special discount. Now it's eleven ninety nine, And the guys with the big money stack it up front by the, by the you know, checkout. So you grab a rosé on your way out. They stack it in the middle. Um, they can make marketing displays. They've got case cards everywhere. And the little guys, like the grocery stores and the chains and the retails, they don't sell your wine. And you have to really lower your price to get them to pick it up. And it's expensive and they don't sell it and you really can't compete. And so, I mean, yeah, there's people may just prefer as a small winery or wineries to not be on the shelf. But even if they wanted to, it's really, we found not a place that we can compete very well. It's expensive yeah. to compete and we don't make our money back most of the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, everyone thinks like, oh, it'd be great if you could get a grocery store and it's like, no, it really can't be. It would be great if I had a huge marketing budget, a marketing team, a merchandising team, and there was promise to sell the wine. But since I don't have those things, it's just costing me money to be on the shelf. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand necessarily how, um, alcohol industry works in general, where you see all these different labels and a lot of those big labels are owned by five companies. Yeah. Or, yeah. And that's that's how it is. And they have, I mean, we're not talking millions of dollars. They have, they do billions and billions of dollars between all their, you know, different streams of revenue, whether that's beer, spirits, or wine. Sure. Um, competing with that is, Washington actually does protect us a little bit from a state standpoint, but, um, but it's very hard. It's a very hard marketplace for yeah, and grocery stores will say to us when we first got into Gelson's, hey, like, we want you to do our tasting bar. Like, on Saturday, we'll open up our tasting bar, and you can pour your wine for customers coming in on a Saturday. And it's like, oh, that's great. That's a great way to sell your wine. Great. Well, it's $200 to $300 a day um, to actually do it, and we need to do it in all 28 stores, and it's going to cost you anywhere from $5,000 to $7,500 for one day to be able to pour. And it's like, okay, thanks, but we can't do it. No, <laughs> you know, but the big companies that you just mentioned that are owned by the same five people do it every Saturday and every Sunday at every different winery. So that's why we just can't compete. Right. And they can pay those people who are going out to do it a lot more money. Sure. To yeah. basically out compete everybody. Um, let's see, there's a question here. Do you feel like you are at a disadvantage being in the Southern hemisphere? Uh, because in uh, quote, distribution phase versus growing phase like your northern neighbors due to COVID. Did that make any sense? Or, uh, um, is someone drunk already? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> hold on here. Let's, uh, let's just do this. Maybe if I can figure out how to do it. Okay, Trey, I unmuted you. Let's just have you ask the question directly. 
or hopefully I did that. On the spot. <laughs> so yeah. what I was asking was, do you feel like you're at a disadvantage being in the Southern Hemisphere right now because you're in the dis distribution phase versus the growing phase that your Northern neighbors are in right now? So, so distributing versus, you know, you, you have your 2019 already in bottle versus us growing the yeah. grapes. Oh, I got it. Um, like, because our vintage years are a little bit different. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah you're, you're 19 yeah. Comes out six months before ours. Yeah, no, not at all. Actually, I would, I would actually say the opposite. I would say in a way, I feel like it works as an advantage for us. Usually, like when we bring something out and it's 2019, they're like, oh my God, you already have your 2019 out already and it's early. And one of the things that it does actually from a business point of view is let us work our inventory a little better. So like we have 2020 already coming down the pike here in about two months. So all of our 2020 wines are going to come in. Uh, obviously, our northern neighbors aren't going to have their 2020 wines in. People always think that's fun to see, and they forget, you know, that our harvest is a little bit different. But what it does is it allows us some time to manage our 2019 inventory. So if we still have a lot of 2019 inventory left here in our warehouse, truly, we could sell it for still the next six months to a year um, and have extra time to kind of push. Like, once our 2020 comes in, we don't have to go, okay, here it is. Like, let's sell it. Like we can wait until we deplete that 2019 and kind of, you know, roll with, with the rest of the cycle and everyone else's vintage. And um, I, I actually think it helped us manage our inventory a little bit better. Nice. And so do you think that's changed at all due to COVID? I think that was more of kind of um, like your comments earlier saying you've got all this wine out and now it's kind of sitting on the shelves. Well, le well, again, um, it's actually worked to our advantage because oh. our heart yeah, it actually worked to our advantage. I mean, um, I, I, I totally get what you're saying now and what the question is. So we did our harvest um, actually in April and May and it all goes in, it, it, you know, it all goes in the tank. So like I said, we do about, out of the 100% of all the grapes we do in, about 4% go to Hillersden. They're from different areas on the vineyard. We have a different winemaker um, than kind of who does our bulk contracts. Um, but again, like it was all in the tank and we were going to reserve, you know, let's say 15,000 cases for Hillerson. But when COVID hit, now we realize, okay, we're going to scale back. We're going to reserve less juice and then we can sell off the rest of the juice. But had we had been in a time of year where we had already bottled all of that and we bottled the 15,000 cases and then we realized, oh, now due to COVID, we're only going to sell nine or 10. Yeah. Then we would be in a tough situation, but it kind of timing wise landed where the juice is still in the tank. And we have an option for it. Um, so that actually, again, worked to our advantage. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. I hadn't necessarily looked at that. How many acres do, does the family own? About 320. That's a good chunk. Yeah. <laughs> sheep need to roam. <laughs> I was going to say, 500 sheep. That's... There's plenty of sheep. There's plenty of sheep. Yeah. <laughs> um, Awesome. Well, um, are there any more questions? And uh, actually, I, I'm going to go with one more. How did you end up in wine? Oh, um, I feel like I've probably told the story to Pierce somewhere there, but um, I that's, actually... That's because we had fun uh, when you were yeah, up here. We did have fun, by the way. I do a lot of market work. I go with a lot of people, and that was like one of, I mean, you know, top days where I was like, we're like, should we just go drink wine? I mean, <laughs> let's just go drink wine. Let's just go do what we love. I, say, um, I know I did the victory tour and then the drinking wine. That's like a great way to say like, okay, we've got it in a bunch of stores. Let's I know because when I was there, I was telling Pierce my love for Washington wine because I really do. Um, and I actually have a side project one day I'll talk to you about, but um, that involves Washington wine um, because, because I have such a love for it. But I actually went to school for film and filmmaking in Baltimore. And I actually started my career in film and moved to New York to do film and TV. And that's why I actually moved out to LA. So worked in the film industry, working in movies for, I don't know, about 15 years or something. Um, and I guess like the easy version of the story is that I just got really burned out. It's like I had done like three movies or like, no, I did five movies in like two years all on location. So I was like never home and I was working like 24 hours a day and I was working for like an actor, director, producer that was like running me ragged. And, you know, we'd be on set or we'd be, you know, in London or we'd be in New Orleans. And he's like, you know, sometimes I feel like you just want to hear the word wraps. You can just go get your glass of wine. And I was like, you know what? 
yeah, I do actually. Um, and it was then that I started to realize, like, I was waiting for my days on set or my hours to be over so I could go eat and drink wherever I was, like, in whatever city I was in. Like, that's really all I really wanted to do. I didn't want to make the movie anymore. I just wanted to go eat and drink. Um, I think that's really how I kind of figured out I had a love for wine. And so, you know, there was a couple pivots there, but, like, basically I left the film industry, which is the only thing I ever went to school for, and lived in New York and L.A. for, and started all over from the bottom up. I went to a restaurant, went back to making like nothing at a restaurant, <laughs> like being a wine director and buying and learning. And then I went and like, you know, got my W set and just like went back making nothing, no pay, started my education from the bottom up. Um, and then, you know, kind of sold wine a little bit direct to consumer. And then I was the wine director on premise somewhere and was buying for on premise and off premise. And then I was like, I really feel like I want to work for a supplier. Like, I really feel like I want to find a brand that I love. And I just started looking and that's kind of how I found Hillerson. And then I've been there for the last three years. Good choice. But you got to do yeah. what you're passionate about. And if there's two things I love, it's like movies and wine. And my husband still works in film, which is fun. So now he does all the movie stuff and I do all the wine stuff. I get the free wine. I get all the perks when we go places. I get like, you know, the industry discounts and we have, he gets to come to New Zealand and then he does, you know, he does movies now, which, you know, he still hates too, but, <laughs> but I, I, I give him a lot to drink, so it's fine. <laughs> he gets his glass of wine at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. People have no idea what a perfect crime it is to work in wine. I mean, it's a lot of work. They, they don't, it's not the romance novel, but like the perks are pretty good. Yeah, they really are. And like, he gets to enjoy them. So, um, so it works out well. So I still get to find out what's going on in film and a lot of my friends work there and, uh, and it's, it's a good symbiotic relationship. But yeah, I mean, I think you just have to do what you're passionate about. And I, one of the things that I love is I love watching people become passionate about wine. Um, you know, I love what I do at Hiller's Inn, but one of the things that I do miss is like, you know, when I was on premise, like pouring that glass of wine for someone and watching them try something new and watching their eyes light up or watching someone go like, no, I, I don't like Chardonnay, I'm not gonna drink a Chardonnay. And you think like, all right, I'm gonna line you up five different Chardonnays and trust me, two of them you're gonna like, right? Cause they're not what you think they are. So doing that and like kind of, you know, I love being that person for my friends. Like you go to dinner and you're the person as you know that picks the wine or they have me curate their boxes and then they buy their cases off wine.com or wherever that I've picked out for them. And so that's, that's, the, that's the one thing that I do miss. And I think that's one of the funnest thing is this industry is being able to find something that you love and like help other people enjoy it and like love it in a very non-pretentious like easy way and once people start you know getting a little bit of that taste they want to learn more and they're more curious and then they want to drink more and then we're all drinking and happy correct mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds right um well if there's no more questions i'll kind of leave it at that and um when you're in washington we definitely have some wine for you to taste and we sounds like uh we have a lot to talk about and maybe some advice to get from you? Yeah, I mean, you know, assuming I'm traveling soon, I'll, I was, you know, telling Paris last time I was there, like, you know, my mother-in-law lives up in, um, I have a lot of family, all my family lives up there. So I've got family in Seattle, I've got family in Snohomish, I've got family in East Wenatchee. So we do a lot of wine tasting, go to a lot of vineyards, they belong to a lot of wine clubs. And we went to, where we go to, we went to Betts, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Betts, yep. Know those, know those guys. Yeah, I know, so that was fun, I know. Um, yeah. And he was very sweet. The winemaker there was very sweet. And, and well, I think he was in the middle of harvest and took the time to give me a tour. And you know, yeah, no, they were like crushed that day. Um, and they were he was pouring for pour it as, you know, <laughs> in the barrel room. So yeah, we yeah, just made a uh, he's an awesome guy. So I will definitely let you guys know when I'm coming back up. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Well, it was, uh, it was a pleasure to have you. And um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for drinking, Hillerston. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we're going to be. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, it looks like you you made some some sales. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> good, good job, Amy. All right, bye guys. Take it. care, everyone. Right. Stay Thanks, safe Amy. and drink lots. Yep. Um, you too. <laughs> bye. Quick housekeeping note for everybody for Saturday: we're doing the call at eight thirty p.m. Um, because Wendy um, in the UK is going to get up for us at four thirty in the morning. Well, actually, probably before four thirty in the morning, and uh, she wanted to do it live, so. Uh, we pushed it back an hour for her so she could uh, sleep one extra hour. But the sheep will be up, so. She might be drinking. Yeah. It. It's a blast. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, thanks, everyone. That was, uh, that was fun. Bye, guys. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.